was 1969, the beautiful day to fly. We were about 100 feet above the ground when I started noticing that something was wrong. It was engine failure. Trees were filling our windshield. I found myself above the crash site. And while I'm processing what I'm looking at, I can see a pilot, and this is me. No two near-death experiences are the same. Out of nowhere, a trailer truck kept me head on. But they typically occur in a very consistent process. We began to go down the river, and my boat became pinned. I was drowning. The first thing that happens is called an out-of-body experience. And they come to a place of exquisite beauty. They very commonly see a light. Deceased relatives come to meet them. The first person I saw was my grandfather. Now I'm traveling like a rocket ship, straight upwards. And with that, <laughs> oh my god, I'm alive. But not every near-death experience is a good one. 23% had hellish experiences. I saw a black tunnel. I was just falling. I wasn't in fear, I was in terror. It was just darkness. Put me back. I don't belong here. I heard a voice before I woke up. You still have a purpose on Earth. I was very skeptical. I never felt alive and then dead. I felt alive and then more alive. I had full brain recordings from the dying human brain. Even though they were unconscious, they were able to give corroborative evidence. She's described herself that she just shouldn't know. This ain't right. You can't be mystified by that question. What happens after you die? This really does show that there is life after death. Hello, it's Renee Bird, and I'm here for season four of the Who Am I Talk. And I am super, super excited to have with me most incredible gentleman, Stephen Gray, and the director of a new feature film called After Death. It sounds a bit creepy, doesn't it? But it's actually incredible. And I'm here to talk about his story, to share about this incredible feature film. You know, I, you know, I'm a Christian woman, so I do believe there is life after death, but it's a mystery. <laughs> and I'm going to get Stephen to explain all about it, what, what, what triggered him to even write and direct this film, and a little bit more about his story. So thank you so much for joining the Who Am I Talk, Stephen. How are you? Great. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. You're very welcome. And I think before we go into this incredible story about the After Death film, I just want to find out a little bit about yourself. You know, what sure. got you into being a director, a writer? Just tell me your story. So I've been a filmmaker for about 15 years. Uh, most of my work before making this film has been in the commercial space. So uh, doing everything from um, sort of doing product uh, videos for an RV company to in Canada here, uh, it's famously the, the CFL, which is our Canadian Football League. Um, yeah, just a bunch of really kind of cool campaigns uh, for brands kind of all around the world as well. Um, but in 2012, um, my brother-in-law, uh, Marco, he was 36 years old, and he, he was actually killed in a car wreck. And uh, it's my wife's only sibling, um, and they're, they're an immigrant family from Croatia. So, you know, very tight-knit family of four, um, now is three. And then a year and a half later, my father-in-law also died. So, you know, this family of four becomes a family of two all of a sudden. And um, that just kind of caused me to ask questions about, you know, is there something after or not? Yeah. So... I actually grew up uh, going to going to church all my life. Um, I, I went to a, a Pentecostal church and then eventually a Baptist church. So kind of a, a full spectrum of <laughs> the Christian faith. Oh, yeah. But in 2012, um, I mean, I if I'm honest, I lost my faith. Um, I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure that I really could believe that there's a God. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of chaos around me in my, in my life at that time. So it kind of let that idea go, but then I had heard of these uh, stories of people who had clinically died and had these experiences and, and then came back. And um, it, I mean, it's very intriguing. Um, 
and I, I wanted to know more, you know, and so part of me was just kind of like, you know, deeply asking that question. I wanted to know, for me, uh, is my brother-in-law still around? Is is he, where is he, right? Was he experiencing? And so um, that's what started this whole journey, you know, and I've been working on this film for a little bit over six years now. Um, it's a long process, but finally we're here with the feature film After Death, playing in theaters. Incredible. And it was basically her loss that created you to to investigate, to to search the journey. I think yeah. you know, we've had we've gone for a lot as a people. We're still going for a lot. There's a lot happening in this world. As Def says, you know, the pandemic, we survived it and we lost people. I lost family members. And a lot mm. of them at that time, a lot of people are just trying to discover and understand, you know, we for the first time, we was actually thinking about morality, thinking what does what could it happen? We can get sick and what happens to us yeah. after. And I think this is so fitting for where we are now and where we was for people to yeah. have some comfort. And I think this is what this film has done is brought a lot of comfort and understanding and questions. Is it? It's thought provoking, isn't it? People are asking more questions than they've ever asked. Very thought provoking for sure. And like, you know, I felt like in my life in 2012 and even 2013, mm -hmm. um, you know, my, because it, it, it was, uh, you know, mortality was at the forefront of my mind and, and our family's minds. Mm. Um, but then the world was going on around us just as normal, and which is very, uh, it was very uh, hard to kind of walk through that because for us, our world stopped, but the, for the rest of the world, every, everyone kind of went on with their life. Mm. And I, I feel like the pandemic um, kind of caused us all to ask that question and 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 come to terms with that, you know, it, am I good? Like, am I going to go? And, and where am I going to go? And, you know, what does that look like? So, I mean, it put a lot of people in panic. Um, there's a lot of fear around death. Uh, but I was kind of seeing, you know, in 2020 to 2000, you know, even now, 2023, people asking these questions more and more. And uh, I mean, that's where I was all those years ago. So I feel like, you know, it's the perfect time for this film to come out and um, and really kind of, you know, allow us to explore that question, what, what happens after and and hopefully bring comfort. So, you know, if people have fear of death, this film, I think, is going to um, ease that fear. I think it'll, it'll, it may not remove it entirely because there's a lot of mystery still to death, but, um, but I think it's going to help, help a lot of people. And like, how did you start this process? Obviously, I have seen that you had a film called Discovering Heaven. It was a short mm -hmm. 2017, uh, a, a Captain Dow Black, who was a pilot, and he had loads of experience after death you know and does that was that the trigger was that like the starting part, point for you to say right I'm gonna expand on it yeah well so I, actually 2016 uh I had the idea for a feature okay. but I have no means to make a feature <laughs> so you know again I'm a filmmaker in the commercial space I didn't really have connections to to the to the film world yeah. so um you know it's like how do, how do you tackle something like that so my my only ability was to create one story which was Dale's I just picked one, one kind of arbitrarily from the people that we included in our feature, who I had kind of started uh, growing a connection to. And um, I just thought Dale's would be a great start. And so, you know, it was kind of like the intention was if, if that's all, if that's all it is, if that's all it becomes, that's fine. But, you know, obviously I, I did want to create the feature. So yeah, I, I set out and made the, the short Dale Black story, which is about a 10 minute short doc. And Dale's story is actually also included in the feature, which uh, we we kind of reshot. But the the ten minute was kind of a proof of concept. And then at that time, I I connected with uh, Hollywood producers uh, Jens and Jason from Cipher Studios uh, with the short uh, as as a bit of a proof of concept. They had just put out an amazing film called The Heart of Man, uh, which was which was released in theaters. Um, a very cinematic sort of telling of the the prodigal son story and. Uh, you know, very also done with the interviews, kind of similar to our film, where it was very genre bending. It was it was half narrative and half you know documentary interviews and whatnot, and that was the intention with this film. So I thought they would be perfect partners to kind of venture down and and make this film together. And so years later, here we are. That's amazing. So it's really lovely to when you start something and then it expands. And now in October, you released After Death and. How is it going? Like I've looked at the figures, it's incredible, and it's I love the pay it forward process as well. So tell me about that. Yeah, I mean we we didn't know kind of what to fully expect, right? It's um mm -hmm. when we released it, so like just to kind of go over a couple of highlights, which are insane. Uh, so we're we're playing in twenty seven hundred theaters across the United States and Canada. Um, I'm from Canada, so I was excited to see it playing here in my home country. Um, 
but it was released as a, a, a top 10 all time uh, opening for a documentary. And then uh, for a faith doc, it's, it's, it's the top, uh, top faith doc of all time. Incredible. And yeah. it's also so it reached number four. Actually, this past week it reached number three in the box office. And then because we added even more screens into the second week, uh, because there was so much demand for the film, because I think people are really asking this question, um, it became the top three uh, documentary release of all time, which is, um, you know, unbelievable. So, and we're hearing you know all kinds of um, responses from people that have gone and watched the film. I think that's like the most impactful and it's kind of you know again the reason why I, I created the film i found these stories hopeful for me and helpful for me in my grieving process um and then i'm we're kind of hearing that same response from people who've gone and watched the film you know we've heard from parents who've lost kids we've heard from you know brothers of lost sisters sisters of lost brothers um all kinds of painful life experiences and how uh you know this film is is helping them um kind of go through that and, and make sense of, you know, some of the pain that they've gone through. Absolutely. And then congratulations for the success. And and it hasn't ended. You know, you've got to bring it around the world. This is a thing, isn't it? You're doing it in Canada and the USA, the UK, please. <laughs> I could think I of know that's people. that's the hope. Yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. Um <laughs> mm -hmm. loads of people in faith and people that are just discovering. I think some people have this thing where if it's a faith led um film it's not for mm -hmm. them. No, it is. It's actually for you to think and you to be inspired. So congratulations. Yeah. And, you Thank know, you. putting all these experts together, how was that? You know, what was the process to, you know, know what stories and the research? Because this is the thing, isn't it? When you think of mm -hmm. people's, the skeptics, like, okay, yeah. you know, this is real. Where did it come from? Yeah. Well, so I just thought about... Um, I wanted the film to kind of uh, represent where I was, you know, back in even 2012, 2013, which was, you know, I lost my faith and I was asking those questions. And so even though, you know, years in, I became convinced that there is something after through these stories and that kind of allowed me to kind of get back to my faith. Um, I wasn't kind of entering the, the the film with that kind of mindset. It was kind of like, how do I go back to where I was before? And we had, you know, people that joined, um, the production that, you know, didn't necessarily even believe in these stories, which was helpful because, um, you know, we're all going on this adventure, you know, down this adventure together and, and we're learning about this stuff real time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that kind of comes through on screen. We, we, we always kind of entered this, enter this whole concept for the film skeptical on, on purpose. And so, you know, not even necessarily believing uh, the, the stories, not taking them at face value for sure. And so trying to get as deep as we could uh, in the stories in terms of the evidence surrounding their death, uh, as well as, yeah, the experts and doctors, you know, what, what do neurosurgeons have to say? What do uh, neuroscientists have to say? What does a cardiologist have to say? Um, we have an oncologist and surgeons, um, you know, all kinds of medical teams that are also part of this film. Mm. And, um, you know, it paints, a, it paints a bigger picture. But we also have 14 different people that we interviewed included in the film who did clinically die between seconds to an hour and 45 minutes. And some of these people are, are from around the world. You know, it's uh, a lot of the stories are uh, from people that are in the United States that come from very different backgrounds. But we also included, uh, there was three people we interviewed from India. There's a lady in Israel. Uh, there's a gentleman who grew up in South Korea. And so, you know, varying different backgrounds, uh, different cultures, uh, sort of different understandings of what the afterlife was, including several people that believe there was nothing. There was some atheists in the film. Uh, they're former atheists now. Uh, they, they've become convinced because of that experience after death. But at the time going into it, they didn't believe there was anything. So varying a big variety of, of sort of backgrounds, which was intentional because, you know, for asking that question, what happens after we die? I mean, we really want to know. So that's what the film explores. And what I, I had a look, I went on to Angel Studios. It's um, basically a production house, isn't it? And they had loads of streaming um, videos talking about the experiences and talking about what people have gone through. And what was really incredible was when the doctors and neurosurgeons were saying they can't have not known what was being happening because they were unconscious, but they were talking about private conversations that were happening. Yeah. It's like, wow. So how they must have been there to have if you're going to be on a operating table and then next minute you're listening to it blew my mind like that's yeah more, imagine yeah like and and that was the interest that was the kind of the hook for us was um I mean how much evidence is there 
uh, anecdotally, there's the stories. But um, so we have uh, Dr. Carl Green in the film who was present during this operation with Pam Reynolds, which is kind of a bit of a famous uh, near to the experience uh, case because it's studied all around the world. It's hard to kind of come up with alternate explanations for, you know, how what her experience was. But essentially, her brain was completely offline. The blood was removed from her brain because they were doing a lower brainstem um, uh, surgery to remove a, an aneurysm, which was at that time a little experimental. This is the early 90s. I think Spetzer had done, uh, I want to say, like two or three successful surgeries at this point, something like that. And um, so, but it's a, it's a very complicated, uh, almost like sounds like sci science fiction surgery because they purposely kill her for over an hour. Her heart stops. They remove all the blood from her brain. Her eyes are taped shut. And she has these these things kind of like have ear, the ear pods in my, my ear here. She has these things in her ears that are emitting, uh, I think it's a 90 uh, decibel uh, uh, clicks that basically kind of transfer from one ear to the other that are, uh, it's a sensor to read that the brain is completely offline. If her brain was online, let's just say uh, hypothetically, she would have uh, permanent hearing loss from, from uh, the, the clicks. Uh, but they're monitoring the brain activity. It has to be offline for them to continue the procedure. And when the, when they successfully got her to that point, to that state, that's when she has the, what this out-of-body experience is what it's called. So her next kind of, you know, conscious memory is basically kind of from the perspective of over, over the shoulder of the surgeon who is now opening her head. Yeah. And she she recognizes that's her down there. She's not alarmed. She feels great. She feels, you know, at peace. And, um, and and angels enter the room, uh, the usher are up towards heaven. But before she goes there and comes back, she's seeing details of, during the surgery that can later be corroborated. There's two neurosurgeons that are present, which can also talk about and corroborate this story. And they don't honestly know what to say of it. They don't know what to make of it because this is when her brain is offline. And again, there's no blood in her brain. So her brain materially is not able to kind of create new memory. Um, uh, while they're doing a very complicated surgery, she's seeing things like uh, the the tool that she describes the bone saw, which looked like to her an electric toothbrush. She had nothing to kind of, you know, you know, connect it to. So she figures it's got to be some something similar to that. She sees the the tool set uh, from the bone saw, which to her reminded her of her her dad's uh, socket wrench set. She sees that they have complications with uh, one leg, where they're where they're uh, the blood's kind of draining in and out, out of her lower part of her body. And they had her vein was cannulated. So they were arguing about it and had to switch to the other leg. Um, she talks about how it was very, she thought it was really insensitive that they were playing this song in the operating theater, uh, Hotel California. She thought, you know, the lyrics are so, um, I don't want to be stuck here forever. She thought that was just really, uh, that it was, it was just insensitive. So she brings all this stuff up, including arguments that they had during, during the operation. And, um, uh, I mean, the neurosurgeons don't know what to make of it. They go back and look at the medical transcripts because they're thinking they're going to get sued. This is medical malpractice. Maybe they did. <laughs> and maybe yeah. they did perform the surgery and her brain was online. Obviously, it had to be. And so they check and it's, no, it's it was completely offline. So yeah. it's just like, how on earth is that possible? And we also have, you know, the study on 14 different uh, people who were blind from birth who had near to the experiences. And in their experiences, they have uh, visual experiences. You know, here, here uh, before they died, they, um, you know, people who are born blind with their retinas detached, they don't have visual dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't know what color is. They don't know what light is. They don't know what darkness is. They, they hear those terms, but they don't, their brain's not able to kind of connect what that could be. And it doesn't visually kind of articulate that. But in the near death experience, when they step outside their body, um, they have a, a visual experience and they're seeing, you know, sort of a spirit body and they're seeing deceased relatives and, you know, angels and meeting Jesus. And then they're coming back um, to their body, but they're still blind. And it's, it's like, how, how do you explain that? Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, has it got you thinking? It's got me thinking, it's got me thinking of, and it's got, it's given me some peace because, you know, I've lost family members and, they have a thing that you come from and you said you went to a Pentecostal church and I come from that. My family is ingrained. My grandfather was a bishop. My uncle is a bishop. And they okay. say we meet again all the time. Yeah. And yeah, you know, yeah. You're crying your eyes out, but you have to almost hold on to that. But we are going to meet someday and they've got songs that represent yeah. that. And yep. this film has given you that reassurance that actually what they're saying is some truth in this. And it's absolutely true. I don't believe it. But 
it's that pain of losing the loved one, you know, bodily. You can't see them. You can't phone them. You listen to their voice. No. But to think that this is actually something that is possible, that you are, it just gives you that peace and that comfort. That I'm going to see my grandma again and granddad and he'll be saying no. and opening my arms. And it seems, feels like a film and it feels dramatic, but why wouldn't God be dramatic? Why wouldn't that end? Wouldn't, why wouldn't that experience be so powerful? Why not? Because it was powerful yeah. when we were born. And then when we move exactly. on. It's yeah. just, so what kind of messages have you been getting? People must have, you must have had so much feedback. People, have you had more people come up after what you've now presented as all the experiences? I bet everyone feels so empowered now to say, mm -hmm. I'm not crazy. This is what I went through, but no one believes me. But look. What oh, yeah. There's been a flood of messages, you know, in in that light. So the you know, a ton of people that, you know, all were messaging us and saying, you know, hey, I was in this awful car wreck. And, you know, I, I died for a period of time. And I thought I was crazy. Like, I've never heard of this before. I didn't know anyone else had this experience. You know, mm -hmm. thank you for making this film, because I feel heard, I feel seen. And, uh, and that was just like another kind of, you know, side benefit of, of making this film and these stories is kind of allowing us to be able to speak about that. You know, I think narrative experiences are, are more common than uh, what's being reported. Um, there's a lot of, you know, well, not, not a lot of people believe in their in their stories. And so it's kind of like this taboo thing that, you know, no one really wants to come forward and talk about because there's, there's, um, you know, there's that feeling of who's going to believe me. And in many cases, people have told their family members or their friends, and they, they don't know what to make of it. They don't know how to react or they don't believe them. And so there's that become creates this kind of hesitancy. And then people, Unfortunately, uh, they they feel all alone in that in this overwhelming experience. That's just like, you know, they're seeing an otherworldly uh, encounter, and like, how do you how do you express that? And there's not really a, a good way to do it for a lot of people. So we're hoping that this film kind of allows more and more people to come forward and, and talk about that. There's a lot of people that have obviously flatlined for a period of time and were brought back, even if it's for moments. And um, so I think there's a lot more stories out there. Mm -hmm. And not to be negative, because I think this is all about light and God is light. Um, but there's another part of it, which was actually quite scary. And it made me want to pray and <laughs> sin and ask for forgiveness for everything. <laughs> but there's a part that people didn't see the light. There's some people saw some dark features and yeah. painful experiences and not to scare my audience, but it's real. You know, they say there's good and there's bad. And the great thing about God, he He does forgive you. So even if you yeah. have to forgive you, but there's been stories that some of them have felt and saw the dark and they called out to God and what what happened with that how is that being received because it could scare people the light is always a better place isn't it <laughs> oh for sure and I think that's um I mean mo any movie that really is kind of touched on near the experiences is have only talked about having encounters I think uh honestly I think I've only come across maybe two books that have you know where people dared to to write about hellish experiences but as we started to unpack uh, near-death experiences, and I, you know, personally had interviewed a bunch of people, including talking to experts who they themselves have interviewed over, you know, thousands of people all around the world, um, it became apparent that uh, distressing or hellish near-death experiences was an experience that people were having. So to be totally honest, um, I mean, I don't even, I don't want to include that <laughs> because personally, I find it really difficult. But there's also this reality that that if that is what people are experiencing as well, um, it's kind of sad to leave that out because um, it's even making those people who had that experience um, uh, even more isolated. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who have heavenly encounters, you, you know, like I said, it's difficult a lot for a lot of people to come forward and talk about that, even more so for people who've had a hellish experience. So there was a study that was done uh, where I think it was over 1,200 uh, patients who had clinically died and had had this near-death experience. And of that study, uh, it was somewhere around 23% of those who uh, came forward and talked about having a near-death experience had a hellish uh, experience. Um, they were very thankful to to be brought back um, to kind of give, be given a second chance at life. We include three different people in the film who had that hellish experience. Um, the good part of it, though, is that there is that grace, like you, you you were saying, and there is that over overwhelming, overpowering love. Um, I think ultimately it's like we have a we have choices, right? Here on earth, we we know we have choices. Um, and and the same same for there too. It's um every 
every one of them that we included in the film would say that that that's what they chose and it wasn't this it wasn't really a surprise it was a surprise that they were uh existing still after they died to them but it was um but it was uh not a surprise where they where they ended up because this is what they chose um and in this place it's essentially it's the absence of god which I think people who, you know, don't have kind of a religious background, um, they, that doesn't mean a lot to them. But if you think about here on earth, you know, we have, uh, we have good and bad, you know, there's light and darkness. So we, we obviously we've seen absolute horrific tragedies around the world, you know, war and all the stuff that we're, we're seeing lately. Um, that just kind of shows the dark side of humanity, but there's, there's evil, but there's also, you know, good. There's a, there's amazing good. You know, there's people out there that are that are every day feeding the poor, uh, the homeless, um, you know, uh, helping widows. And there's there's wonderful people and and action out there in the world. So there's both sides. In hell or where this this place that people describe uh, is like a distressing experience. It's what other people might call the void. It's this place where it's complete uh, absence of light and absence of good, absence of hope, absence absence of joy. It's only despair and, and death and chaos. So it's basically, uh, there's no, it's not yin and yang or what, you know, some people might say, you know, this mixture of good and light or whatever. It's only that. And then with God, though, in, in heaven, it's only life. It's only light. It's only love. It's, it's, there is no death. So it's it's those are polar opposites you know and they couldn't be further apart but in this space of darkness there were people that like howard storm in our in our film he was given this moment where he's he's remembering himself as a small child and i think it was once or twice that he would happen to be brought to a sunday school program at a school or at a church down the street and he was uh he was taught this really simple song uh jesus loves me this i know and as a kid he just he he you know this was encouraging for him um he eventually had a you know he had a very rough life and and uh he walked away from any kind of belief in that he was a he was an atheist and uh but in this place he's wondering why he's remembering that and then he heard this voice tell him to pray so eventually he calls upon jesus to save him uh and he just knew instinctively this is the only one that can bring me out of this place and Jesus shows up, pulls him out of that place, brings him up towards heaven, and he says, "You know, you're you're making a mistake. I don't like. I belong there. That that where I was. That's what I. You're making a mistake." And and Jesus just says to him, "We don't make mistakes. You do belong here." And I think there was this opportunity where, when he was a kid, it was so simple. It's like he just understood. Yeah, that's that's the savior of the world. It's simple, mm. and um. You know, it's, it turns out, you know, that's true. And then when he's in this place where there's nothing else that can save him, there's nothing he can do to get himself out, uh, he calls upon Jesus and and Jesus saves him. And I think that's, um, I mean, it's a powerful testimony. Um, there's several people in the film that kind of have similar accounts. And yeah, I mean, it just, <laughs> all stories... This, this journey for you and the team, the producers, obviously there's Chris, another the director, um, mm -hmm. must have been mind-blowing and also life-changing for everybody. So people went in there, oh, yeah. they must have came away and thought, <gasps> and I'm sure it made them reaffirm if they had faith, their faith, or mm -hmm. really discover faith if they didn't have faith and just say exactly. there's something else bigger than this, <laughs> something bigger yeah. than this. And a little bit of fear, you know, when we was younger, you know, my parents would say I'd go Sunday school and, you know, remember what Jesus and God. And I had that inner fear that someone else is bigger than even my mom and dad. And some people are over time. Hence, when you see what's going on in society, I think they've lost. It's become secular. They've lost just this hope. That's all it is. It's it's yeah. a system and it's a bit of faith. You know, if you're not feeling very well, you can pray about it. And it gives you that encouragement and courage to keep moving forward. That's what I use. You know, I always, people ask me, you know, what does it mean? I'm just saying it's principle based. It's just giving me hope when I go for anything, I've got something to hold on to. Yeah. And what you've now done with after death is given people something to hold on to about the after death, but also just in general, because purpose is everything, isn't it? And now it's going to make yeah. them examine 
rethink, reconnect. It's just. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, we can navigate through life uh, better uh, if if we have that hope that there's something after life honestly just doesn't make any sense if 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 there is nothing after and and um and it's not wishful thinking you know that that, that there is something after over 4000 uh confirmed accounts of people who had clinically died that are pointing to this kind of greater reality that there is life after that becomes really difficult to ignore you know this it's it's becoming a thing that um i mean scientists and doctors all around the world are paying attention to and and looking into you know whether the not everyone's coming from it uh, from a, a faith perspective, and they don't need to. It's just, it's just this is something that's happening, so it, it, we can't really ignore it. And it, I mean, if I guess you could, but if you're ignoring it, it's kind of um, you know you're becoming, you're you're blinding yourself to some you know something that's actually happening to people all around the world. Discovery, and obviously, I am one hundred percent optimistic. I believe in it because of who I am and my faith, and just my own individual relationship and experiences. That know there's mm -hmm. something greater, but there's going to be lots of people of for, from this feature are like, "Nah, what are you talking about? It doesn't exist." And how you've dealt with that, and what's been the backlash? Because unfortunately, there's always the good. People are really excited. The reviews are amazing, but there's going to be some people that just don't believe it because of their way of thinking. Is there right? Yeah dealt with that and how has it been or has it been more lean towards positive or middle neutral i don't know um yeah we've definitely gotten some back backlash um you know the the film's been ripped apart by uh some media uh that it's you know it's whatever religious propaganda or um or you know what why is it that people were only you know seeing heaven or hell why isn't there some other thing and so, you know, and whatever, those are fair questions. Um, I just kind of think of myself again back, you know, years ago, and that's honestly probably where I was, you know, really kind of critical and 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 uh, not really wanting to maybe uh, for this to be real in the beginning. And so, it's it's difficult, you know, for people to change their worldview, especially if they're if they're in it for a number of years. It's very difficult, um, you know, and and something uh, even in the science community. Um, it's whenever there's like new science or new discoveries, uh, sometimes that takes a long time for people to process and, and actually come to terms with um, as well. You know, that's kind of the history of science. Um, you know, there's cardiologists, uh, you know, around the globe that have, have kind of come to this conclusion after uh, they didn't believe in that. But after enough patients have come forward and, and talk about talked about it. And again, verify details that have happened in the, in the room. It's just, it happens over and over and over and over again. At some point, you just kind of got to go, I mean, there's got to be something after, right? It's, it becomes convincing for people. Um, but I get it. You know, it's it's hard for people to kind of come to grips with that. We made this film, though, with, again, a skeptical kind of point of view. And, and our hope is that uh, both people with a faith background and those would not can, can approach and watch this film. We made them for both. You know, because death is something that affects all. Yeah, and it's guaranteed, isn't it? Like, that's where we're headed. Yeah. And it's just that peace. If that's where we're heading, it just gives you that faith to know. And also, some something really poignant, one of your um, guests spoke about that. Now do what you need to do. Whatever it is that you want to do in life, get it done. You know, because yeah. that's where we're heading. So we want to, in between, spend as much time, forgive. And I know it's not easy because yeah. we go through stuff. But that was really powerful. He just said, because of what he's gone through, He's, you know, people who get sick, they say that. But when people have actually seen maybe what happened after, they're like, whoa, I'm going to go on that trip or I'm going to be make it up with my family, yeah. whatever it may be. So I think it's definitely made people who have watched it, people who have experienced it, to say life is for the living. Let's do this. Let's do enjoy. And, you know, yeah. connect with, as they say, the higher power, God, that if yeah. when that happens, I can actually go and say, guys, you know, this is what I've learned. And it's more Exactly. Power. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so Dr. Mary Neal, who uh, she was an orthopedic spine, spine surgeon, and she was pinned at a waterfall for 30 minutes in 62, I think it's 62 degrees Fahrenheit water at that time in southern Chile. Um, so, she, you know, without oxygen for that amount of time, and she had this powerful narrative experience. But in that experience, she had a full life review. And in that life review, which is common with a lot of people who have had near death experiences, I think it's very sobering. It makes me really <laughs> think about life differently. You know, if, if it's all being recorded and you get to kind of replay it all um, in its entirety, 
she saw not only her life, though, uh, but also the lives of people around her and sort of the backstory of the people in her life and sort of the the, the context for what brought them to a point where they either hurt her or someone that she loved. And she's gone through some really horrific experiences growing up. Um, she she was witness to that again, but but it was from a different perspective. It was from one where, you know, all of these kind of different events led those people to become that way or do this thing. And it wasn't to... Um, it wasn't to say that this is okay, but just to kind of give clarity and context. And she was witness to, to you know, where people were from where they were born to, to the point that brought them to, to that, where she wasn't, she wouldn't know that before. And then beyond that, she was also shown 30 degrees out from herself and how little actions in her life actually had a ripple effect and affected people that far out that she's never going to meet you know, small things to large things. One thing where she, she moves from, she becomes a doctor in California and moves to Wyoming to start her own practice. Well, that's going to have a different impact on different people there compared to where if she had stayed in California, it's not good or bad. It's just different. But then also things like small things, like holding the door open for someone or giving someone a smile on that day. And you don't know what that does for that person on that day. The questions they were asking, it brought them to that point that they needed that. Um, and how that that then ripple effects, you know, that's going to transfer to someone who it changed the course of their day and is now going to, you know, hopefully affect others in the same way. So she was showing that perspective. And I, I think that's incredible. You know, I think we, that kind of causes us to think about, you know, living life differently. Yeah, that's incredible. Cause and reaction. And also that person that you might see that doesn't is not very, you know, approachable, quite be a bit miserable. But you always got to stop. There, what is it? What's happened? Yeah. How why are they unhappy? Give them a hug. That could change yeah. their whole life and make them feel better. And actually, if they've been disappointed, make them feel there's something in humanity that, you know what, not everyone's like that or whatever that circumstance may be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Angel Studios. Now, it's a faith-led production. What's next for you guys? Obviously, you've done After Death. Are you going to have an extension? Or what do you see the future after this? This is incredible. Obviously, touching the world with this film. Mm. What's the plans? Yeah, I mean, so I'm I'm on post production on an Amazon Studios uh, documentary. Um, we're early in development on on another feature, but um, After Death is you know it's still a passion of mine, and I, I, we're all we're talking about potentially turning it into a series oh, because wow. I think there's there's more stories and even there's more science. Uh, and again, kind of on a, a bit of more of a global scale, um, kind of branching out further outside of just North America, that this is happening everywhere, and so we kind of want to chase some of those stories. That makes sense because now from you releasing this, it's made people who wouldn't have spoken about it share. So it's an actual, yeah. wow, it could be incredible where it goes. And as you said, there's so much more stories to be told that can actually enhance and give more evidence to the after death. Because <laughs> it's like the same stories from all these different people, they all can't be experiencing something different. It's, it's real. If it's the yeah. same, that means it's going to get more and more convincing and more and more powerful for people to believe exactly. yeah yeah and then you know lastly you know I'm really congratulations for this film I'm really inspired I'm excited for the future for you as an individual for the team but you know what would you say to someone who sadly you had a loss which inspired you to do this but to even go into the world of film and production it's not easy anything creative is really tough but what would you mm. say to someone you know what triggered you to write this and to direct this what would you give to a young person anyone who actually give my age group that could say oh I want to go into this world what advice would you give them yeah I mean it's I think it's worth it to to chase those passions and those dreams um I my encouragement would just be to, to find something that uh is very personal to you or um is going to allow you to to withstand say be staying the course for a number of years everyone sort of has a different path to to filmmaking mine was definitely a little strange a little odd um you know and, and this film is many years in the making too so i think some other part of it too is just um you know knowing especially with features and even i've heard the same with television series as well um typically to kind of get something off the ground it could take years but not to be uh, discouraged by that. I think if there's a story worth telling, it's worth, you know, putting in the time and effort and um, yeah. And just kind of stay in the course. Um, you know, it's, it, I, I, I'm excited about seeing more and more stories uh, come out there, especially ones that kind of um, 
you know, speak to the human condition and, and lift people up. And, uh, you know, there's so many amazing true stories out there too. So. Well, thank you. And then how can people watch? Obviously I'm in the UK. I do have a US following, but how can they yeah. watch this film after death? So if you, the simplest way would just be go to angel.com slash after death. So it's playing right now in, in the United States and Canada and in theaters. We hope to bring it internationally and, and it's very likely that we will. Um, so on that page, uh, you can just basically follow wherever it's playing, which includes that eventually, you know, if it, if it becomes available on streaming uh, or for purchase, uh, that same URL is going to work uh, through all those windows. Incredible. And ladies and gentlemen, it was absolute pleasure to have you, Stephen. Thank you. It's given me hope. It's given me my faith. And I hope when you get to see this film, ladies and gentlemen, it gives you the faith and the conviction that there is something else there's a mystery but there is life after death and i'm really really excited about the future thank you so awesome. much Thank thanks you so for much. having me on you're very welcome <laughs>